from its Manchester studio for your Sunday night enjoyment, drama, comedy, suspense. ABC Television presents Armchair Theatre. Good evening. Today is a day of mourning. A day of mourning not only for the people of the United States, but for millions of others throughout the world. International tensions and crises have temporarily become forgotten in the sharing of a universal grief. For today, November the 9th, 1961, the man who has become known as the greatest man in the world will be taken to his last resting place. That man, of course, was Jack Powell Smirch. And for the next hour, the ITV network will link up by transatlantic cable with the Federal Broadcasting System of America to bring you eyewitness accounts of his funeral. Over now to Washington. This is Robert P. Darrow. I'm speaking from a vantage point overlooking the White House and Pennsylvania Avenue. The funeral cortege of Jack Powell Smirch will pass this point on its way to Arlington Cemetery, where Jack Smirch will be buried with full military honors. As far as the eye can reach, you can see people lining Pennsylvania Avenue. You can feel the grief of these silent people, ordinary people from every walk of life, from every state in the Union, who've come to pay their last respects to the man who soared through the mysterious vast reaches of outer space and touched greatness. And now, the funeral procession is approaching. There's no doubt that this is the most elaborate, the finest, the solemnest, and the saddest funeral ever held in the United States of America. Now you can see the casket, draped in the stars and stripes and directly behind walks the President of the United States. Behind the President are detachments from every unit in the armed forces, from every organization in the United States. The governors of the 49 states, every senator, every congressman, the nine justices of the Supreme Court will march in solemn procession behind the gun carriage bearing the body of Jack Smirch to its last resting place in Arlington Cemetery. This is R.D. Kallmeyer speaking to you from Arlington Cemetery. I'm standing near the clean white shaft of marble which will mark the tomb of Jack Pal Smirch. At the base of the shaft, there is carved the simple device of a tiny rocket ship, the exact replica of the incredible machine in which this boy or that's all he was, a mere boy. Flew through the blackness of outer space with courage the like of which the world has never seen and was the first man to land on the moon. This boy became America's and the world's most spectacular and illustrious figure. And now, this boy is dead. There isn't a mother in America today who isn't saying with Jack Smirch's mother, my boy is dead. There isn't a father in America who isn't saying today with Jack Smirch's father, my son is dead. There isn't a man, woman, or child in America who isn't saying today, my pal, Jack Smirch is dead. And now the moment of final farewell is here gun carriage bearing Jackie Smirch's casket has come to a stop in front of the platform erected before the white marble monument. It is from this platform that the president will deliver the funeral oration. The president advances to the 
microphones. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, it is not usual for the chief executive of this great nation to deliver a eulogy. Yet on this tragic occasion, I break with precedent. I do so in all humility, for I know that the deep sense of loss of the people of this nation must be given expression here. So in speaking these words, I am speaking not as an individual, but as the spokesman for 180 million Americans. And yet, as an individual, I did know Jack Smirch better perhaps than anyone else. He was a great man, and like all great men, a simple one. But what can I tell you of Jackie Smirch that you do not already know and feel in your hearts? There is no need to tell you of his courage, his fierce patriotism, his brilliant intellectual endowment, the warmth of his personality, his flawless integrity, his extraordinary scientific and technical gifts, his deep abiding faith. There is a time for words and a time to remain silent. I can pay no greater tribute to the memory of Jack Smirch than to ask every man, woman, and child within sound of my voice to rise, to bow their heads in silent reverence, and to let their hearts speak. My friends, Will you rise? If they only knew what the lousy bastard was really like. Listen, Ira, we've got to have that appropriation. You must make the Senate Committee see that. Unless I can get it, we can't guarantee the security of our rocket installation. Frank, I want this bill to go through. I have gone on record. But it seems to me that you, as head of the FBI... Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Mr. President, General Galway, yes, sir? Charlie, I left word I wasn't to be disturbed by anybody. But something bigger, Bogus. I hope you want to see him immediately. Yeah, show him right in. I'm sorry, Frank. I'm afraid we'll have to discuss the bill another time. Well, you say I'll help you that way. Oh, don't go yet. Uh, something's happened. The FBI may have to be in on it. Well, what is it? Come in. Now, come in, General. You better stay, Charlie. Sorry to disturb you, sir, but this couldn't wait. A rocket ship piloted by a man has landed on the moon. What? When did it happen? Is it one of ours or Russia's? One of ours, fortunately. There's no doubt about this. I've had every expert in the Air Force checking and rechecking the data. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. The first manned rocket has landed on the moon, and it's American. Oh, <laughs> boy! Two days ago, I would have sworn on a stack of Bibles that such a flight was absolutely impossible. Let us start at the beginning, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Right President, but I'm a little excited. Well, naturally. Well, now, two days ago. One moment. Yeah. Before you go any further, I have one question. How is it I wasn't informed that such a flight was being planned? But, sir, The I... country's in a heck of a state if the President can't be trusted. But this isn't an official flight. What are you talking about? Well, that's the incredible part of it. I knew nothing about it because we had nothing to do with it. Our own manned rocket won't be ready for 18 months, and even then we're not even sure it'll work. We never are. All right, General, tell us everything you know. Well, two days ago, I received a call from one of our top radar men. He was checking some new telescopic radar equipment and picked up an odd radio signal. It was a message in Morse code. Here it is, exactly as he recorded it. I read it. 
This is Jack Pal Smirch. I'm the first man to land on the moon. Tell Gresham. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep now. Uh, is that all? Well, that's all there was in the first message. There were two others later. Well, how can we be certain this message comes from the moon? Well, it's a little complicated trying to explain it to a layman, but uh, putting it in its simplest, crudest terms, the radar unit automatically calculates the distance across which any given signal is to be transmitted as well as the direction relative to the Earth's axis. Uh. So I've had every expert in the Air Force checking. There's no doubt about it, that message could only have come from the moon. Fantastic. And, and you say there were two other messages? Yes. Uh, here's the second. It reads, there ain't nothing much to see up here. There's something for the history books. There ain't nothing much to see up here. Who is this smirch? Oh, I have all the information on him. Uh, perhaps you'd better read the third message first. Of course. It was received only an hour ago. It reads, taking off for Earth today. This joint stinks. Bring on the dames. Are you quite certain that was decoded properly? Yes, sir. Uh, well, come on, General. Tell us everything you know about Smirch. Well, he's uh, 29, uh, a mechanic, served in the Army in Korea. I'm afraid his record isn't very good. You mean his Army record? No, everything. I'm afraid it's bad. General, speak up. Come on, this is no time to mince words. How bad? Well. Well, perhaps you'd better hear for yourself. I brought a man along with me who can give you the facts firsthand. He's a reporter from the New York Globe, Peter Hunter. Yeah, I know him. Good man. Reliable, accurate. Get him in here, Charlie. Right. As far as I know, he's the only newspaperman who's got wind of the story. When I first heard what he had on Smirch, I could hardly believe it. But Hunter has no reason to lie. I'm certain now that his facts are correct. I thought you should judge for yourself. That's why I brought him to Washington. Good. Peter Hunter, Mr. President. I'm coming, Mr. Hunter. President. Sit down. Thank you, sir. I understand you have some dope on Jack Smirch. Well, yes, sir, I do. Uh, right here, I have... Well, I want to hear it. But first, I'd like to know how you got in on this story. Oh, well, you see, sir, I spend my summer vacations up in Maine. Right next door to my place is this old ruin of a house with a broken-down barn and, oh, an acre or so of land. It's pretty isolated. Nobody's lived in the place for years. Well, I was surprised to see some activity around the place one day, so I snooped around and... Uh, Found out that a man by the name of Gresham had moved in. Gresham? Just a minute. That, that's the guy mentioned in the first message, isn't it? What does he have to do with all this? Gresham, uh, Gresham is the man that invented the rocket that smirched through to the moon. He's a, dip, uh, he's a retired uh, high school science teacher, contributes to popular mechanics, writes science fiction. Yes. Science fiction. Oh, oh, carry on, Mr. Hunter. Well, Gresham wasn't very friendly. He discouraged visitors, so I kept away. Then one day last week, I noticed the roof of the barn had been removed. I did a little more snooping and... Inside, I found a rocket ship. In the barn? Yes, sir, apparently ready for a takeoff. Couldn't have been very big. No, not more than 15 or 20 feet long. Mr. Hunter, I wonder if you would make a rough drawing of this. It might... Oh, that won't be necessary. We have all the plans. You have, but I thought you told me the Air Force knew nothing of this flight. Well, uh, Gresham applied for a job on the rocket research project, claimed we were going about it all wrong. And he submitted the plans, and well, we checked them and decided he was a nut. You did what? Well, I tell you, sir, the man's a screwball. Some screwball. Yeah, but he had no training. Just a minute. Maybe that's exactly what the inventor of the first rocket ship to the moon had to be. A nut without college degrees. Look at Henry Ford, the Wright brothers, Lindbergh. They were not... The one thing I'd like to know is where did Gresham get the money to build this rocket? Yeah, so would I. If I remember rightly, General, the appropriation for your rocket research fund is something like a billion. Now, you tell me how a man could succeed on a high school teacher's pension where you and your billions failed. Well, I don't know, Mr. President. The plans he submitted were for a tiny one-man rocket. Even so, it must have cost a fortune. Where did you get the money? I don't know. Maybe he's got a rich wife. Maybe he plays the horses. Yeah, or well, maybe the Russians finance him. No. You never can tell. I'll have a wire tap put on Gresham immediately. Oh, Frank, lay off. This is one thing we're not going to try to pin on the red. But if Smirch is a commie, if we can establish the... We're going to establish that Jack Smirch is a 100% red-blooded American boy and that this flight was carried out with the full blessing of the United States government. Don't you see what's happened? The greatest historical event of the 20th century has just taken place. Uh, never mind the 20th century. The greatest individual achievement in all history. And it was done by an American. Get that through your head. We worship Lindbergh, and all he did was fly across the ocean. What do you think the American public is going to do if this boy Smirch gets back to Earth in one piece? He's going to be hailed as the greatest man in the world. And you want to give the credit of this thing to the Russians? Use your head, Frank. I see a point. General. Sir. 
I want your records to show that Gresham has been an employee of the United States government for the past three years at a salary of $50,000 a year. Yes, sir. Appropriate the sum of $150,000 for back salary and see that he receives a check immediately. Yes, sir. Now, let's return to Mr. Hunt. Well, Gresham... Oh, excuse me one moment. Sir, sir. General, oh. when did Gresham first submit his plans? Uh, several years ago, before Sputnik 1 went up. Thank heaven that was before my time. Uh, don't worry, General. I'm sure your action was justified at the time. I'll stand by you. Oh, thank you, sir. Yes. Now, carry on, Mr. Hunter. Well, I finally got the story out of Gresham. Like the General here, at first I thought he was just another nut inventor, but after talking to him, I became half convinced that this crazy crate of his might just make it to the moon. It was just a hunch. Why didn't you write the story? Oh, uh, I'm coming to that, sir. You see, Gresham didn't want any reporters hanging around, so I made a deal with him. I'd handle the whole story exclusively. He promised me photographs, sketches, interviews, the works, but I couldn't break the story until after the takeoff. I couldn't even tell my editor about it. I couldn't risk it, you see, on account of Gresham. Well, that turned out to be a big mistake. Gresham double-crossed me. Smirch took off 24 hours early. Well, I wrote the story anyway, but it was too late. You can imagine what my editor thought. That you were drunk. Drunk and doped. Well, I couldn't blame him, though. The whole thing sounded pretty phony. I couldn't even be sure Smirch had taken off. But I figured if he had, there was a chance he might make it back to Earth. So that's when I decided to get the whole Smirch story. I'd be the first one in with it and have the biggest scoop any newspaper man ever dreamed of. Mr. Hunter, the United States government wants to see that story before it's published. Of course, this government would never dream of imposing a censorship on the free press. Well, excuse me, Mr. President, but uh, I'm afraid you're going to be forced to censor this story. You see, there isn't a single fact that I found out about Jackie Smirch that's fit to print. Now, right from the start, I realized that some people might not accept the facts, so I took the precaution of tape recording everything I was told. Now, right here, I think we can start with this one. You see, there's a microphone in here, sir. Now, uh, the first place I went to was Westfield, Iowa. Jackie's mother runs a little hamburger stand out there. Hamburgers, hot dogs, sandwiches, canned soup, ham and eggs. I don't serve regular meals before six. Oh, that's all right. I'm not very hungry. Just a hamburger and a cup of coffee, please. Coffee now? Fine. What a nice little place you've got here. It's all right. You get a lot of truck driver business? So? Your name isn't Smirch, is it? What if it is? Do you have a son, Jack Smirch? No. Aren't you Mrs. Emma Smirch? Your husband's name was Henry. You had two boys. You're pretty nosy, ain't you? Well, I don't mean to be, Mrs. Smirch. I'd just like to ask you a few questions about your son, Jack. Jack is your son, isn't he? What if he is? Well, I'd like to talk to you about him. You from the cops. What makes you say a thing like that? Anytime anybody wants to talk to me about him, it's a cop. Well, I'm not a cop, Mrs. Smirch. I'm a reporter. Your son's done a pretty remarkable thing. He killed somebody? I always figured he'd end up in the chair. No, no, it's nothing like that, Mrs. Smirch. I can't tell you exactly what he did do, except that he's taken off on the most amazing flight in the history of aviation. He may become the greatest hero America has ever known. Jackie flying? So now he's going to be a hero like Lindbergh. Greater than Lindbergh if he makes it. We're not sure yet when he's going to land. So, he ain't landed yet. So you're going to be very proud of him when he does. I hope he gets blown to bits. Hope he gets blown to bits. Did you say Jackie Smirch? Yes, I understand he was once a pupil here. Yes, he was. I remember him quite well. He was in my class when I had the eighth grade. I, I wasn't principal, principal then. then, just a teacher. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember Jackie. From all the pupils I ever taught, and I've taught thousands, I think he was the most vicious boy I've ever known. If there was one shred of decency or goodness or plain, ordinary human feeling in him, I was never able to bring it out. And the school board here in Westfield, well, they always say I'm too soft with the boys, but I, I overdo the human touch. But to me, Jackie wasn't human. He was a sadistic little monster. His classmates hated and feared him. He was dirty in body and mind, rotten to the core. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember Jackie. Every morning when I shave. Yes, Jackie did that. For the night he stole from a boy scout. 
I'm afraid there isn't much I can tell you about Jackie Smirch. I've been a minister here in Westfield for nearly 30, 30 years. years. But in all the years I've known him, Jackie came to church only once. I'm afraid the Smirches are considered a bad lot by everybody in town. The father is serving a sentence now for stealing spotlights and radios from tourist cars. There's a younger brother, a weak-minded lad. He was sent to the reformatory for theft. No, I'm ashamed to say there is little good can be said of the Smirches, but Jackie seems to have been the worst of the lot. I know of at least three young girls in this town whose lives have been ruined because they believe Jackie promises to marry them. For years, the Smirches have been despised and feared and considered a menace, and it's been beyond my power to change them. Perhaps if they had come to church, but as I told you, Jackie only came to church once. That was the night he bashed the sacristan on the head and stole the altar cloth. Smirch, you said? Let me see now. <laughs> Smith, Smollett, here it is. Smirch. Some record. 1945, assault with a deadly weapon. Two years in the state reformatory, not the teacher. Not the teacher. 1947, robbery and assault. We're up to church that time. Two years. 1948, first theft. One year. 1949, attempted rape. Paroled after serving one and a half years. Inducted into the armed forces. That's all. <laughs> That's all he said. If he's going to be the big hero you say he is, mister, guess the army must have made a man out of him. Yeah, I remember Smirch all right. On account of him, I practically went through the whole Korean campaign walking backwards. If I hadn't, the little weasel would have shot me in the back, sure as anything. Next. Yeah, he was laying for me from the day we hit the beach, so. I mean, let's figure out why. He hated everything, that guy. One day, we was dug in on the yellow, he got so full of hate, he went out there and wiped out a machine gun nest, single-handed. One of ours. You bet your life I know Jackie. Him and me, we're, we're sort of going together. You know what I mean? Engaged like. I mean, never give me no ring. <laughs> but we're engaged, all right. Oh, if he thinks different, he's got another thing coming. He ain't gonna run out on me. It's two weeks now, I ain't seen him. You know where he is, mister? I, I gotta find him real soon. I'm in trouble. Real trouble. I wouldn't be telling you all this, Mr. Only. I'm a little croxy and kind of lonely when you're sitting all by yourself in a crummy flea bag in Brooklyn getting crocked and wait for some guy to show up and do like he said. And believe me, when he shows his kiss around here, he ain't getting away until he does. He's got to. He's just got to. I don't care how big a hero he's going to be. He's going to do just like he said. Dirty, lousy bum. Dirty, lousy bum. <laughs> Why did this have to happen in my administration?
It's appalling. Appalling. Are you quite sure? Uh, are you certain the people you spoke to were not mistaken? Uh, you heard for yourself, sir, and I double-checked everything. Here for the static copies of Smirch's police and army records. Uh, no. Uh, sorry, you'll have to come out. You can't hush up that kind of background. Not unless you impose a censorship. How can I? There's no question of security involved. The press would never stand for it. I think they will, Mr. President, uh. if they're approached in the right way. I don't think any self-respecting editor will want to publish this. It'll have to be a voluntary kind of censorship, though, self-imposed. You think we could get complete cooperation? Well, look at me, sir. Here I am with the biggest story in the world, and I'm willing to let it go down the drain. I... I don't want to sound corny, sir. It's just that... Well, I feel that what this thing ever got What he's trying to say, out. sir, is that it's a question of national honor. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, let's go to work. Charlie, I want every editor of every newspaper in this country flown down here for a conference immediately, top secret. All right. Mr. Hunter, you are now on a special assignment for the United States government. You will work with Charlie handling the press and you will be directly responsible to me. And Charlie, I want a meeting of the emergency committee of the cabinet call for one hour from now. I already called it, sir. Goodbye, General. Sir. Have we any way of knowing when Smirch may land this rocket ship of his? As far as we know, uh, from radar, Smirch is anywhere from 72 to 24 hours away from the Earth. We'll have to work fast, as fast as possible. Let's assume he's only 24 hours out. Have we any way of knowing where he may land? Uh, we can't be certain of that either, but uh, most likely it'll be somewhere along the eastern seaboard. Can we establish radio communication with Smirch? We've been trying to, but so far we've had no answer. I want reports on the hour every hour. Yes, sir. Any other ideas, gentlemen? Frank? Yeah, I think we should try to persuade the agents to keep a round the clock watch on everybody who ever knew Smirch. Especially his mother and that girl in Brooklyn. They might make trouble. All right, let's play it safe. Go ahead. What about Gresham? Uh, Gresham seems to have disappeared. I've tried to find him, but I can't locate him anywhere. You haven't been looking in the right place, Mr. Hunter. This afternoon, I had a report from the New York State Police. Gresham is in the alcoholic ward of Bellevue Hospital in a coma. That's all we needed. The world's greatest inventor, a dipsomaniac. All right, have him flown down here to Walter Reed Hospital as soon as his condition allows. And Frank, I want a day and night guard outside his room. Check. As soon as we are certain the smirch is going to make it, there will be a radio and television network broadcast. I want you to make it, General. Yes. Stop preparing a draft. And Charlie, check the networks. All right. The committee. All right. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. Now let's go to work. All right. Come on, Hiram. Look at the face. Going around in circles. Now I think we ought to adjourn until we get some definite news of Smirch's landing. Our here has told us the steps he's taken. We've approved them. Any further speculation is a waste of time. I can't bring myself to believe that Smirch is as bad as he's been painted. Oh. I think Hunter's informants have been grossly exaggerating. I mean, what if Smirch were a little wild in his youth? Lots of young men have gotten straightened out after a few youthful indiscretions. Youthful indiscretions? Yeah, give them. The that. man is a thief. A seducer of women, an assassin. And you expect another Lindbergh to step from that rocket ship? <laughs> Why, his own mother hopes he gets blown up. I don't think Smirch is as bad as he's painted. No, sir. We're going to find out that he's worse. We're speculating again. We'll know the truth when he lands. In the meantime, the only safe course is to be prepared for the worst. Howard. Yes, Ira. You haven't said much tonight. I agree with you, Ira, that speculation concerning Smirch's character is a waste of time. Nevertheless, I'd like to hear what your views are. I'm concerned about the reaction in Asia and Europe. As Secretary of State, that is your major concern, of course. Anti-American feeling has never been greater. If Smirch is what we think he is, and it leaks out, the ridicule to which this country will be exposed will, in my opinion, do our prestige abroad tremendous harm. Mm -hmm. You agree? Mm -hmm. I don't, I've been silent because I've been afraid to voice my thoughts. They're so horrifying. Smirch's character is fairly obvious. His own mother's fervent prayer that he be blown to bits is eloquent testimony to the nature of this creature. There is no doubt in my mind that the man who is about to become the greatest hero of the 20th century is a congenital hooligan and a moral imbecile, mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. unequipped to cope with the prodigious fame that is going to be thrust upon him by a nation wild with adulation. I do not think it an exaggeration to say that the United States will shortly face its most desperate crisis since Pearl Harbor. Yeah, All we can do is hope. Hope? For what? 
Let us hope with all our hearts that his mother's prayer is answered. It's time, Mr. President. This is the Federal Broadcasting Corporation. Please stand by for an important announcement. We take you now to Washington for a special bulletin on vital interest to every American. The announcement will be made by General Galway of the Army Air Force Rocket Research Project. General Galway. Fellow Americans, the President has conferred upon me the signal honor of announcing to the world that a flight into outer space by a human being has been successfully carried out. For the first time in the history of the world, a man from our planet has landed on the moon. The flight was made in a rocket of revolutionary design built by an American inventor and piloted by a young American war veteran. His name is Jack Smirch. The Army Air Force has been in constant communication by radar and radio with Mr. Smirch ever since he landed on the moon. His return voyage was successful, and his rocket ship is expected to land at LaGuardia Airfield in New York City sometime tomorrow. Our next bulletin will be two hours from now. Until then, there remains only one more thing to be said. Jack Smirch, on behalf of the United States government and for the American people, I salute you. Charlie, I doubt if you'll have time for much after tomorrow, once the cheering starts. Darkness has fallen, but you can still hear the cheers of the crowd here at LaGuardia Airport. Such cheers have not been heard in this land since Lindbergh landed the tiny spirit of St. Louis back in 1927. It's a mass of people going wild with adulation verging on hysteria. As it is with the crowd here at LaGuardia Airport, so it will be throughout the nation and the world. It's Jack Smirch's destiny to be worshipped as no man has ever been in our time. From the moment his incredibly tiny rocket was sighted over the field, less than an hour ago, the cheering has continued without let-up, ear-shattering, almost frenzied waves of sound. Jack Smirch has long since been spirited from the field, but I doubt if the crowd here is aware of this yet, or of the fact that Smirch fainted at the controls of his ship at the moment of landing and had to be bodily removed from it to a waiting ambulance. There's no official word yet as to where he's been taken. There were many fine speeches planned for Jack Smirch's reception, a reception illumined by the presence of, of some of the most prominent American citizens and a brilliant array of European diplomats. But all these distinguished men have been silenced by the frenzied cheering. It undoubtedly will go on for hours until they've cheered themselves into exhaustion. You've never heard anything like it before and probably never will again in our time. <laughs> understand the conditions under which you're being allowed to interview Smirch. Conditions? Yeah, Pete, you're beginning to sound like a senator. There's a rumor you used to be a newspaper man yourself, Pete. Can't deny it. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry, boys. I don't mean to sound stuffy. I'm just carrying out the president's orders. Well, what's the big mystery? Why all You'll the hush You'll find out why in a minute. Now, first of all, I want to make one thing quite clear. All stories on Smirch must be submitted for clearance. Oh, this oh, is great. Right. Right. Suppose some budding young Pulitzer tries to pull a fast one. Like you, for instance? <laughs> oh, no. Now, I wouldn't dream of crossing you, Pete. But an offer of five grand from time, say, might look awfully tempting to some penniless and unscrupulous hack. Well, just save yourself the trouble. In the first place, anybody, and I mean anybody who tries to pull anything like that, is going to find himself an unemployed newspaper man for at least 60 years. Oh, boy, this oh, is pretty. Really? Oh, really? Reckless, huh? Let's just call it acting against the best interests of the United States. And in the second place, it wouldn't do you any good anyway. There isn't an editor in the country who'd touch your story unless it is cleared. Now, I don't mind telling you this clearance isn't up to me alone. The president has set up a special press committee which includes the editors of Time, the Associated and United Press, presidents of all major radio and TV networks, and half a dozen senators from both parties. Well, and that, well, that well. is off the record now. Need to move it? Mr. Hunter. Oh, all set, nurse? He's ready, Mr. Hunter. All right, bring him in. Now, I don't want to tell you people what kind of stories to write about Smirch, but let me give you a little hint. Unless you write the kind the committee wants to see in print, 
They won't be printed. In other words, we can't write the truth about smirches. Is that it? Maybe you won't want to. Well, All right, here he comes. That's all you like. I uh, don't like uh, answering a lot of jerky questions. It gets me very nervous, you know? <laughs> Had enough of that at reform school. All that my psychiatric snooping around, uh, trying to make out like I was nuts. So there ain't gonna be no questions, okay? Now, first thing I gotta say is, I uh, should put it over on them jerks in that lousy Air Force we got, huh? You can't say that, Mr. Smirch. No, but they were the guys that said I couldn't fly a jet in Korea. Yeah, they shoved me in the infantry. Go on. You walk, walk, Smirch, they said. You ain't got the guts or the... Uh, the brains to fly like us fancy gentlemen. Oh, boy, did I show them up? Yeah, you just put that down like I say. The U.S. Air Force stinks, huh? Jackie, I told you before, you can't say things like that. I can say anything I want, can I? I'm a hero, ain't I? Yeah, the greatest hero that ever lived. First guy to the moon and back. Yeah, who's gonna stop me from talking, huh? Now, look, Mr. Smirch, you are a hero. But I'd like to point out that American heroes in the past have been noted for their modesty. You must have heard of General Charles Lindbergh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know about him. And you can tell the cockeyed world he's a big nothing compared to me. Yeah, all, all of them big shots is jerks. That uh, Limburg, that uh, Admiral Bird guy, you're dime a dozen heroes. I'm the guy that flew the moon, you know. Now, now, no, Jackie, these ladies and gentlemen are here to interview you. Why don't you give them a chance to answer a few questions? Ah, nuts to that. Now, look, look, I did it, see? I did it, and I'm going to talk about it. Now, uh, give me a cigarette, and you guys just sit down and listen to what I got to say, huh? Hunter, what are we supposed to do? This boy's got a mind like a sewer. He's never going to say anything that's fit to print. Well, every newspaper man has ambitions to write fiction. Here's your chance to become another Hemingway. Okay, you guys, you want to know how I feel about what I've done, huh? Okay, I'll tell you. I'm, uh, I'm the king of the world, see? And I want everybody to know it, huh? The king of the world. Yeah, go on, write that down. The king of the world, yeah? <laughs> that's right, huh? <laughs> Asked how it felt to be the greatest hero of our time, Jackie Smirch merely smiled modestly and said, My achievement has been, I fear, slightly exaggerated. Just did a job that had to be done. Done something that nobody's ever done before, see? Nobody had the guts. John, it took guts, plenty of guts, to get in that rocket and go off the way I done. <laughs> there ain't nobody living has got that kind of guts. <laughs> A boyish grin lit up his face, still wan and pale, after his fantastic ordeal in space. He spoke little, but what he said had the ring of sincerity. I'm very happy, he said, in a low tone, barely above a whisper. I'm glad I came through, but I don't see what all the fuss is about. Anyone could have done what I did. I just had a job to do. I uh, saw so Gresham invented the quick. Well, so what? Oh, I ain't saying he ain't entitled to some credit, but he was, uh, he was just a nut. No, he, he was lucky. No, honest, no kidding. You know, half the time he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't have to get in it and fly it. You know, I, I could have blown up even before I took off. Remember that. Yeah, and you tell the American public to remember that when they're handing out the credit. I'm the guy that took the chances, huh? The real credit, Jackie said, belongs to Dr. Grensham, the inventor of the rocket. He is a man of genius, one of the great benefactors of mankind. His achievements rank with Edison, the Wright brothers, Albert Einstein. I took the chances, see, not Grensham. I, uh, I took a gamble and I, I won. Yeah, I, and there ain't nobody gonna forget that, not as long as I'm around to remind him. Yeah. You wanna know why I did it, huh? Huh? Why I took the chances? Yeah, I'll tell you why. Because, uh, I want to show certain people that Jack Smirch is somebody and they're nothing, nothing, see? Yeah, now, now I'm even with them. I show them, I show them all. Yeah, that, uh, that crummy teacher of mine got me sent up when I was 14. Yeah, that preacher, he got me two years. Yeah, frame me. Yeah, frame me, that's what. Yeah, and, and that punk sergeant, yeah, always giving me the dirty details. Lead man on patrol, trying to make a, a target out of me. Yeah, and that, that, that old, old lady of mine, she ain't no better. Throwing me out of the house when I was a kid. 
I, I, I hope you wind up in the electric chair, she says. Yeah, well, she's in fresh shock. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, you write it down, write it down. All, all, the, all the time I was up there, I kept saying to myself, I uh, saw, huh? And what were Jackie's thoughts as he soared through the blackness of space with only the stars to keep him company on his flight to the moon? Jack's boyish face took on a reflective look, and he said in his quiet, soft-spoken manner, no, I wasn't really alone out there. I kept thinking of all the people who'd helped me and had faith in me. My eighth grade teacher who first roused my interest in science. And our minister back home in Westfield who taught me the real meaning of Christian humility. My sergeant in Korea who died saving my life. They were all up there with me. And all my loved ones, dad, my kid brother, and mom. I never forget what she used to say to me when I was a kid. Jackie, she'd say, in the years to come, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, just remember, Mom is praying for you. Mom was with me up there. Jackie paused, puffed deeply on his cigarette, then added solemnly, and someone else was up there. God was with me. I never doubted that. Yeah, sure, I was scared. Wouldn't you have been? I, I, I could have blown up any minute. No, I, I didn't even know if I was going in the right direction. Yeah, but that's no reason to start uh, sniveling a God to help you. I, uh, I don't go for that bunk. But me pray? No, that's a laugh. I believe in Jackie Pal smirch. That's the only thing I do believe in. Anyway, I, I didn't need to pray. I had something better in case I got the jitters. Yeah, before I, before I took off, I uh, lifted a gallon of gin off Gresham. And uh, every time I got to thinking about cracking up, I just took me a good spit slug. No, yeah, no, boy, by the time I hit the moon, was I stinking? Yeah, as soon as I stepped out, bomb, it hit me. Yeah, I was the first guy ever to puke all over the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nobody's ever done that before. Yeah, I <laughs> no, ever done that. evening, here is the news. Jackie Smirch is still confined to his suite at the Walter Reed Hospital. The medical staff in attendance, in attendance say that further rest is imperative before he fully recovers from the traumatic experiences of his flight. Meanwhile, the American nation is waiting with ever-growing impatience for the first public appearance of its greatest hero. For the second time in two weeks, the official reception planned for him in New York has had to be cancelled. Peter Hunter, the spokesman for the White House in all matters concerning Mr. Smirch, stated today that the reception definitely would be held, but that no new date had been set. Mr. Hunter emphatically denied rumors that Mr. Smirch is becoming restless in hospital and would like to leave. Yeah, what goes? You and your doctor's orders. Yeah, there ain't nothing wrong with me that abroad couldn't fix up. Now look, you promised me, you promised me you'd let me have a, a couple of dames up here. And what happens? You don't even let me see no nurses no more. Come on now, you know why. All right, so I made a few passes. Is that a crime? Aren't the male attendants taking good care of you? Yeah, they ain't doing nothing for me. I mean, you can't kid me who they are. They're FBI men, yeah, watching me day and night like I was some kind of a hood or something. But we're concerned for your safety, Jackie. Now, don't hand me that. Just keep me a prisoner, yeah. Even the bribe from the window. Look at that. Yeah, well, you're up to something. You're going to get away with it, see? I want to see a lawyer. I'm going to make a big stink, huh? I want to get out. Yeah, I want to get out, see? Gentlemen, I apologize for calling this meeting at this late hour, but I'm sure you'll appreciate the urgency. I feel the final decision must be made by this cabinet. We can no longer postpone Smirch's public appearance. Our censorship arrangements are still 100% tight, but already ugly rumors are beginning to circulate as a result of Smirch's non-appearance in public. My barber told me this morning he heard the search had gone insane. My jacker yeah. told me that she heard he died as a result of injuries to stand on landing. There are dozens of other rumors, all equally fantastic. Yes, yeah, but we can't go on in this way, keeping him prisoner at the Walter Reed. I agree. The reception will have to be held. Smith will have to appear. We'll have to make him a general in the army, give him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Our only hope is to find some way in which Smith's public behavior can be controlled. Just what you propose, Ira. Two days before the reception. 
A secret conference in New York City on, all, on November the 7th of top government officials will ask some of our leading journalists and educators to be there. The purpose of the conference will be to instruct Smirch in the ethics and behavior of the uh, heroes. Oh. I'm glad you approve. Frankly, I think it's our only hope. And if it doesn't work, Ira? If it doesn't work? God help the United States. Excuse me, Mr. Secretary. Yes, Frank. Hunter's on his way up with Smudge. Good. <laughs> Gentlemen. Gentlemen, your attention, please. Mr. Smirch is on his way up. I think it would be best to conduct this meeting with a minimum of formality. Mr. Smirch would feel more comfortable. Secretary? Hello, Pete. Jackie? Huh? Secretary of State. Hiya. Mr. Smirch, I consider this a great honor, and on behalf of the people of the United States, Jeez, I extend hot. to you... hot in here, isn't it, huh? I extend to you... Can we get a little air in this pump? I extend to you the warmest feelings of... Oh, come on, can it, can it, huh? Got enough hot air in this joint without yours. Look at us. The sweat's pouring off of me. Come on, let's get this clam bake over with, huh? Uh, yes. The sooner the better. Mr. Smirch, or rather General Smirch, present in this room are some of America's most distinguished citizens. I regret that there is no time to present them to you individually. Hey, uh, what's everybody getting up? Is the, the meeting over? Mr. Smirch, the President of the United States has just entered this room. Yeah? Mr. Smirch, the President of the United States. Oh, how you coming, Mac? Pretty good, General Smirch. I'm honored to meet you. <laughs> uh, likewise. <laughs> yeah. Please sit down, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, take a seat. Thank you. It's hot. It's hot, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> hey, what you staring at, lady? Oh, Jackie, button up your shirt, will you? Huh? Huh? And she never seen a tattoo on a guy's chest before? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Smirch. I didn't mean to stare. Uh, it, it, it's a beaut, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, a Jack done it for me in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's terrific. Yeah. I, I was, uh, I was going out with this dame, uh, see, Sadie. So, uh, so I got him to tattoo her name right across Mr. the middle. Mr. Uh, huh? shall we proceed? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's, let's get it over with, huh? <clears throat> what's it, uh, what's it all about? Mr. Smirch. I, uh, like some gum? Huh. Uh, no. Mr. Smirch. Yeah, sure. In a few days' time, you will be presented publicly and receive the acclaim of an admiring world. Uh, about time. Would you like some gum, huh? Okay. Come on, come on. Put it in your pocket. Thank you. Gum, huh? Go on. Well, Mr. Smirch. Every one of us here has nothing but unbounded admiration for your magnificent courage. You are truly one of the world's great heroes. And for that very reason, we feel that public conduct, the way you act, your choice of the things you are... Every one of these must be, uh, and I'm sure you would want them to be, uh, absolutely above reproach. Heroism such as yours carries with it great obligations. In the course of your public career, you will of necessity meet the world's leading figures. For example, you will be presented to Queen Elizabeth of England and address the House of Commons. Yeah. The Premier Chu Enlai of China is planning a formal banquet in your honor in Peking. Mr. Khrushchev of the Soviet Union has invited you to visit Moscow where he will personally confer upon you the Order of Lenin. Yeah? Well, nuts to that. I ain't eating no chop suey with a bunch of gooks, and I ain't taking no commie medals. I, uh, I don't mind addressing the House of Commons, but the only way you get me to Moscow is to put me in my little old rocket ship, give me the H-bomb, and say, go on, drop it, Jackie boy, drop it. Blow them reds right off of the map. Yeah. Should have a glass off, you ask me, huh? Don't <laughs> you right. must not say things like that. If that remark became public knowledge, its effect on our foreign relations would be disastrous. Who'd you say this guy was? I, sir, am the Secretary of State of your country. And I appeal to you, Mr. Smirch. The eyes and ears of the world are upon you. 
Surely you have no wish to see the international goodwill which we've struggled to achieve during the last five years destroyed overnight by a few thoughtless statements? Ah, that's no skin off of my mind, Oz. Look, I'm the guy that made it to the moon, see? I say anything I want to. Nobody's shutting me up! Nobody wants to do that, Mr. Smirch. We only ask... No, we plead with you to exercise a little discretion. Well, will you guys quit yapping? It's, it, it's roasting in here, huh? Uh, what, what do you guys want, huh? We feel you need to be coached on how to act in public. And, and huh? now this, this gentleman here is, is Mr. Cameron Spottiswood of the American Embassy in Paris, one of this country's most distinguished young diplomats. General Smirch, it is an yes. honor to meet you. I have been asked to take on the task, <laughs> and I'm sure it'll be a very pleasant one, of coaching you in the amenities of public ceremonies. I, 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 I've made a study of the American hero. I don't suppose you're familiar with my book on the subject, The Public Life of Heroism, hmm? Huh? No, I thought not. But the main point I tried to bring out in my book was that the principal characteristics of the American hero are modesty, self-effacement, and altruism. Do you follow me? Let me try to put it in simpler terms. Men like Lindbergh. Yeah, yeah, I get you. You want me to act like a softy, huh? Like that uh, namony pamony baby face Lindbergh guy. Yeah. I saw him on them old news Mr. wheels. Mr. men like General Lindbergh and Admiral Byrd. Or... Byrd, Byrd, yeah. I yeah, know all about him, too. Uh, Hunter, Hunter told me all about him. Byrd, yeah. he was just a... Smirch! Now, oh, look, them guys like Lindbergh and Byrd that had nothing on the ball, see? Huh? Oh, Jesus hot in there, huh? Now, listen, I, I, I don't want to know from all this hero bunk. All I'm interested in is when do I start, uh, cutting in on the parties, huh? Uh, uh, when is there going to be something in it for me? You know what I mean, money. Money? Yeah, money, the, the, the green stuff, lettuce. Oh, don't look so dumb. You're getting yours. That's all I'm interested in, the payoff. Gee, I, I bet I could make a bundle, huh? Just, uh, you know, like advertising, endorsing things, like on the newspapers and TV, like, uh, like cigarettes and uh, toothpaste and, and hair cream? Yeah, big money. Oh, geez. I want to get some place where it's cooler. I've been cooped up plenty for three weeks. I want some air, huh? Hey! Hot dog! Listen to that! That's my name they're shouting down there. Now go on, baby! You talk! Sell those papers! That's money in the bank for your pal, Jackie! Yeah! <laughs> that point, Gentlemen, uh, the situation has well, become intolerable. The good name of the United States is hanging in the balance. Only desperate and resolute action can save us now. There is only one way out. I have discussed it with the Secretary of State. Read all about it. All about the world's greatest hero. Bill old Jackie Smith, huh? Hey, listen to that. That's my name, the shot, and I'm a Falling out of the window. Mr. President, I'll take it away. All right, all right. Come on, We haven't got much time. The police will be here any minute. Now, remember, this was an accident. You saw it happen. It was an accident, so act accordingly. Mr. Bamberger, Mr. Deegan, your newspaper men, get going. Mr. Bamberger downstairs, come to the street angle. Mr. Deegan, yes, on that typewriter, start sending this out to all wire services. Now, here's your lead. At exactly 9.27 this evening, the greatest man in the world, overcome by the oppressive heat, fainted as he stood before an open window and plunged to an untimely accidental death from the 18th floor of the Central Park Hotel. The cream of the nation's leaders who had gathered at a special reception honoring General Jack Smirch witnessed the tragic and appalling accident that snuffed out the life of America's most illustrious and spectacular figure. Now, present... Present where Chief Justice Guggenheim starts sobbing, Judge. Come on, start <laughs> sobbing. Who broke down and sobbed openly as Jackie fell to his death. Good boy. Now, Senator Edith Burke Johnson collapsed, collapsed, collapsed on a couch as Jackie's slender body hurtled to his death 18 floors below to the pavement. The grief-stricken cries of those who witnessed this appalling tragedy were but an echo of the anguish that horror-stricken people the world over will feel as they read these words. If they only knew, but they never will. Well, so long, pal.
We'll be back in a moment with the names of tonight's cast and news of next week's Armchair Theatre. Armchair Theatre was an ABC network production from Manchester.